We're going to be getting started in just a minute. Please find your seats for the writers' panel. Thank you. Are you are you mocking me? Are you mocking me, John? No, I just I just no. <laughs> I'm I'm just I'm always hot for a hot mic. I just can't be off on hot mic. Are you guys ready? All right. All right, then we are going to begin. Hello. I... We are going to begin. That time I was mocking you. Yeah, I know you were. <laughs> That's all right. I love it. In the context of the boat, I know where you live, so. <laughs> That's all right. Fight, 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 fight. I was just wondering if I could say one the fight. <laughs> Ten zero zero five. Yeah, yeah. Enjoy. Uh, See you later. I'm, uh, I'm John Scully. I am your moderator today, and today's uh, the panel this hour is uh, on memoir, and uh, we have three fascinating memoirists here, and they're going to introduce themselves to you very briefly, and then we're going to have about 35 minutes of discussion up here, and then after that we will go into uh, question and answer, uh, so be ready with you whatever questions you might have. Please remember I have three rules for questions. First is question is in the form of a question, the second is that all questions are one part questions. And the third is to keep your question as brief as you possibly can. And the reason for this is not just because I'm a control freak, but so that we can get to as many questions from as many of you as possible in the time that we have allotted uh, to each other. So uh, the discussion today is memoir. Let's have our panelists very briefly introduce themselves, starting over here with Mr. Hodgman. My name is Mr. Hodgman, and uh, I'm the author of two books of nonfiction about me, which I guess make them kind of memoirs, which are Vacation Land and Medallion Status, and I just want to say thank you to the person wearing the banana costume over there. Uh, as as uh, Scalzi was introducing the uh, panel, I saw you sort of crossing along the back, and I was so terrified you were going to leave. I was like, we're losing the banana man. Uh, what, what does this mean about my career? The banana man's walking out before we even get started. Like, I've seen enough goodbye. But then you walk down here, and I apologize if I've misgendered you, but, but you know, I didn't. Anyway, banana person, thank you for sticking around. <laughs> I think any time that there is a, a person in a banana suit, uh, that is, uh, that, that's just a sign of a good time. We have people in the banana suits show up to the, uh, to the WPA sex strike uh, picket lines last summer, and I remember those were always very good picket days. Is there a particular banana you're cosplaying as? Uh, let's see, we'll be extra this Whoa! What's happening? <laughs> shit is bananas. This shit is bananas. Yeah, yeah, yes. What a perfect theme for Thank you. Possibly, that makes sense. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. He's, he's not, it's not just happening, man. It is, it is indeed a theme. Mara. Yes, uh, my name is Mara Wilson. I am uh, author of the memoirs, uh, Where Am I Now? Uh, available through Penguin Random House and Good Girls Don't, available on the app formerly known as Scrib. Uh They have a new name now. It begins with an E. I cannot Everrand. remember. Everrand! Yes, Good Girls Don't, available on Everrand, rolled by yours truly, or as an ebook. So, yes, you can get it. Uh, you can get that online, or you can get Good Girls Don't in uh, the store down here. Or, excuse me, you can get. You can get uh, you can get Where Am I Now in the store on this ship. So, yes. Uh, and I am a chronic overshare. I think we're doing a signing later. If we have the book there, then that's possible. You can get it and get it signed. You can. You can go ahead and get it signed. Yes. By you. I mean, or, 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 or by Salzi if, if he wants to. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll allow, allow it. Enough. I'll allow it. <laughs> by, by, by any of you, really. <laughs> yeah, you have my permission. People get me to sign Matilda the book all the time, and I didn't write that, so, you know. <laughs> My name is Mari, or Mari Naomi. Um, I'm a cartoonist. I've written and drawn five memoirs, because until a romantic resume, ages 0 to 22, was the first one. And the most current one was I Thought You Loved Me, and I've also done four works of fiction, um, yeah, comics. 
right. Uh, I, have a, I have a bunch of questions, and the first one is the really super simple, easy one, which is you all wrote memoirs, talk about how you happened to uh, do that thing, and why that thing, uh, aside from anything else. And Mara, go ahead and get us started. Well, I am one of those people where I am just happy when I am writing. Um, I, I think that sometimes I require a little outside stimulus because I, I can get a little in my head about things and I think, oh, is this interesting? Should I be writing this? Should I be working on something else? So I, I think that for me, uh, I, I always liked telling stories about my life and in college people were telling me, you know, you've had a pretty interesting life. And I thought, oh, have I? <laughs> Um, and I, yes, I have. Um, I come from a family of storytellers where, you know, my mom would tell a story and, uh, and, and, you know, everybody would sit around and listen. My father's a very quiet man. He's an engineer and engineers are a type. And, but, but I, for real, yes, I've, I've, I'm friends with enough and I've dated enough and I'm, I'm, I'm I always say I'm half Jewish and half engineer. <laughs> Um, but he is the kind of person where when he told the story, people would listen. So I think I picked up on storytelling from him, and then after college I started doing live storytelling, where I would tell stories about the weirdest things that had happened in my life. And you know something is a weird story when you tell it to your therapist, and she says, that's the craziest story I've ever heard. <laughs> so I started, I started doing live storytelling, and eventually I wrote a book for a website um, called craft.com, about the struggles that a lot of child actors have. And I had a lot of interest in it because of that. And I was writing in, in my life story because of that. And I was writing other things at the time. I had a play at the New York Fringe Festival. I had, um, I, was, I was writing for a website called Reductress, if anybody knows Reductress. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's like a satire of women's magazines and blogs. Um, I was writing, you know, I was writing for craft. I was writing for a couple different places. So I was writing comedy, I was writing plays, I was telling stories, I was, working on a YA book that may or may not ever see the light of day. And uh, people were interested in hearing what I had to say about my life. So I thought, okay, well, I will go down this path for now. And, uh, and it was rewarding. It was tricky at times, but it was really rewarding. And, and uh, it, it, I felt in some ways like I was accepting my destiny as, uh, as a storyteller. And, and yeah, and I'm very glad that I did it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've always been an oversharer, um, and I find that helpful because first I have a very little shame. Um, so if I tell, like I don't, I, I'm pretty non-judgmental. I think about most things, especially uh, sexuality and, and stuff. Um, like I don't like care what people choose to do as long as they don't hurt other people. Um, and I find that when I overshare, people will, you know, who might not normally share things will share back to me. And I just love that. I love hearing other people's stories. Um, the way that I ended up, like, so I used to want to be a novelist. Um, that didn't really pan out when I realized that uh, writing a novel and publishing a novel um, are like opposite ends of the happiness spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so when I, once I realized that, I got, I got serious, I got into video game writing, and that's what I did as a profession, but at the same time, for fun, I had recently discovered underground comics where um, kind of punk rock girls were telling their own stories, and, I, and up till that point in the early 90s, I'd never seen other people who weren't celebrities tell their own stories, and I'm like, oh, I can do this? We can do this? Like, I have some crazy-ass stories, because I'm also a little spontaneous and adventurous, and again, have no shame. Um, so it was, it was, so I was, started making my own comics and handing them out to friends and family and coworkers, which I probably shouldn't have done the last part. Um, <laughs> and uh, 14 years later, voila, I had my first graphic memoir published. So like, just overnight happened. <laughs> John. Uh, so I'm sort of opposite to Mara in that I am uh, least happiest when I'm writing. Well, I should say I, I hate starting writing. Once it gets going, it's tolerable. Well, I mean, I personally always say that like creating and, and writing, I, I like to say that writing is sex and rewriting is childbirth. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I barely know about one of those things. <laughs> So I'm just going to say it's like writing, and I really hate starting it. And in terms of writing nonfiction about me, you know, I had a career writing 
arguable comedy writing um, for TV and for my own books of ridiculous fake facts. And around 2012, after my third book of fake facts came out, I just wasn't finding that to be particularly funny or inspiring. I felt like I was really going, not only going to the bottom of the barrel for these uh, Zeppelin jokes that I was famous for making, but like, it's not scraping, like getting just chunks of barrel. It was just not, no fun. But I knew I had to keep going and make, you know, make a living, but also make a creative living, which is important to me. So I followed Microbiblia's advice um, and started a, 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 a little low-key residency at Union Hall, which is a performance space in Brooklyn, uh, where once a week I would just have to say something on stage. And initially that was to develop new comedy material. Right. But what I found more and more, and for whatever reason at that stage in my life, I just wanted to tell stories about what was going on in my life, yeah. and it was, and people were reacting to it. And those stories eventually became uh, Vacation Land, and then Medallion Status too. So what was, what's interesting to me hearing uh, these sort of uh, how I got into memoir, there two of you used the same word, and one of you was doing it performatively, the, the magic of oversharing. I mean, does there have to be uh, kind of that uh, extra version of self in order to do uh, kind of a, a memoir? Do you have to want to absolutely share with you, what, uh, yourself more than the average person? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think necessarily because I actually think that I, as I've gotten older and I've sort of reined in the oversharing a bit, I, I feel a little bit healthier about it. I mean, sure. And what I always said was that um, a lot of people, I think perhaps most people, go into, um, um, go into to arts and creativity because they feel a lot of emotions, they feel a lot of you know, pain, they feel a lot of different experiences, and they really want to channel that into something. And, uh, and I think that that is good and that is healthy, but what I always say is, uh, is coffee grounds plus water do not equal coffee. You need to filter it. Mm. And I mean, I'm a tea drinker, so what do I know? But <laughs> same but, principle applies. Same principle applies. You know, it needs to be filtered. You need to be strained. Otherwise, you're gonna. Okay, I was gonna say then you're gonna end up with stuff stuck in your teeth. But the metaphor falls apart there. But <laughs> but yeah, and I know because there have been times where I felt sort of forced in my life to write about something that I wasn't comfortable with, or perhaps that somebody else in my life wasn't comfortable with, and. The people around me and were always like, oh, are you sure you want to do this? And so I think that it's really good to have that. And I think that writing about my life for so long, I've also sort of realized the joy. And I've lived a very public life on and off since I was five. And I think that I kind of learned uh, only in the brief past few years, like the joy of having secrets that I can keep to myself. And there's something really beautiful about that, about saying, OK, what is the side of myself that I only show to my friends, my family, my partner, my dog, my cats, you know, uh, or even just to yourself, if you're not a super extroverted person, who is the person that you know, that you love, and the person that you keep to yourself? And I think that there's something really beautiful in that. Sure, sure. Oh, you can't tell everything. I no. mean, nobody can tell everything. In fact, some of the memoirs... All right, I'll give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a lot of the memoirs I know are the most guarded people that I know with their personal space because people will come up to you and think that they know you. Sure. Because, and people always assume that just because I put like a thousand people in my memoir about having sex that oh, that's everybody. No, yeah. it's not. Yeah. <laughs> it's also like, like, I think in some ways fiction can be more revealing. Yeah, because it's inadvertent. Oh, um, it's so much free. It's very freeing it, when you're like, oh, yeah. I can fight about all this. Yeah, stuff. fiction can be fiction can be so much more because it's it's inadvertent. Where it was, whereas with memoir, memoir, you're you're you are sharing consciously, but you you have to think a lot about what goes into it. And sometimes if you publish with uh, a major publisher, they might tell you something like, you need to change this person's name more so we do not get sued. Always. <laughs> um, which is something that I, I had to go through, and I was like, oh, oh, okay. Um, and, and, but I mean, that also happens with smaller, with smaller and self-publishing as well, I think. You, you also have to think about, like you mentioned, not giving stuff up to your coworkers because you could get in trouble for that, Absolutely. unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. John, do you have anything to add? Well, you know, my first job was working at a literary agency, and I was reading a lot of a lot of you know manuscripts from hopeful 
oddballs all over the country and world who wanted to publish their novel or their memoirs, but typically novel. And uh, I, I, the sheer amount of dreams that I crushed, I think, oh. destroys my karma forever. But I also <coughs> learned that like there is this very, very deep impulse to want to tell a story. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I took away from, that was one lesson I took away from that. Yeah. Another lesson that I took away from it was that um, uh, I, a lot of the people, and, and it was really a lot, of, a lot of the retired guys in this world mm -hmm. who were facing down middle age were right. sending me their semi-coherent fake Tom Clancy books. Uh -huh. Because they wanted to have written the book, yeah, right. And there is there is a desire to tell a story or your story, which is honest and sincere. And then, but there is also this feeling of like, time's running out in my life. I should have written a book by now. Yeah, everything will be okay if I write a book and get it published. Yeah, then I will be, I will leave something behind. This is a very middle-aged white guy impulse, and that was a lot of people who were submitting to writers' house. And one of, my, one of the things I took from that was that I never want to do anything, write a book, or do anything in order to have just done that. Right. right. Like, for me, the only writing that would matter if I were going to do any of it would be because I couldn't not tell the story. Sure. Like, I couldn't find any way to evade telling. And this is true in your life, too. Like, you know, there's sometimes something happens to you and you're like, I cannot wait to tell this to John or my friends or my family sure. or the next person I see because there's something so compelling or interesting or funny or weird. And when I do now write candidly about myself, that is still the rule. Or even when I tell a story on the boat, it's like, do, do I, I, some stories I just feel like I have to tell, like I have to get this out of me. Sure. Sometimes it's because something really funny happened. Yeah. Sometimes because I don't know exactly what happened and if I talk about it, I'll figure it out. I'll figure <laughs> out what it means to me personally and so forth. Like, and that's a different feeling, I think, and a better feeling than having just gotten a book published, which is hard and meaningless, right? But it's also acting out of fear versus acting right. out of passion. Exactly. You should never yeah. act out of fear. Yeah. I also think, I mean, I know I, it is a bit like in a musical, you know, you sing in a musical because words aren't enough anymore, you need to sing, you need to dance, you need to sing about it, you need to dance about it. I think that that's, uh, that's kind of, you know, which, really cool. Yeah. And yeah, although I also think that like, like I have a friend who is writing a memoir for their child. They're not ever going to publish it. They just really, and they're a good writer, but they just wanted to write a book for their child to be like, this is what my childhood was like, this is what my adulthood was like, this is what it was like when I was staying late at work, this is, you know, how I met your other parent. And, uh, and yeah, and I think that that's good in a way, and their, their child may or may not ever want to read it, but I think that, I think that that's also good, you know, I think that there's a lot of focus in Western society about making it big and publishing and making money and doing this. But I also think that sometimes you can just write things for friends or just for yourself and that is just as good enough and that is just as true. I'm so glad that you brought that up because um, I have nephews now um, and my father, who always wanted to be a writer and still wants to be a writer and he's probably the reason I wanted to be a writer before I could even read, mm -hmm. um, he, uh, I, I finally convinced him a couple of years ago to start, start writing his memoir. And he doesn't want the memoir shared. It's not, um, it is just like a kind of a list of all the things, like all these stories I hadn't heard because I started realizing, oh, time's running out. Like, I want to hear these stories and have them down. And he's been sending them for every, every birthday. He sends me a new chunk of his memoir um, that he'll, you know, he's sharing with his nephews also. Mm -hmm. but it's, I, mean, I mean, I've read his books, and he's not a bad writer, but his memoir, is, I love it. Like, it's yeah. so good. And I'm so glad he wrote this down. Yeah, I mean, you know, exteriorizing your experience is such an incredible path to self-knowledge. That's why therapy works. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that everyone is getting therapy, I trust. Uh, <laughs> but I, I also, like, if you're not journaling or telling your story in some format that can be read by someone else, even if it's 100 years from now, I, hope, I encourage you to do it, because not only will you get some extra therapy out of that, and maybe you can turn it into a book about Maine and sell it for money or something. But also, like, I, I'm really touched by your friend who's writing a book for their child. What a beautiful and 
fucking long chore that must be. But <laughs> you know, even if the child says, "Get out of here," they'll want to read it eventually. Yeah. But more to the point, like someone, uh, you know, if we are lucky to have them, fifty, a hundred, or a thousand years from now, will understand uh, human experience. Yeah. I, I, and I mean, in yeah. particular, the people on this boat, like. We want the we want the world to understand who you are because yeah. it's such an incredible thing that might be. That's how we have you know history is yeah. people keeping track of what they did during the day. And I, I wouldn't want to lose the incredible experiences and inner lives of everyone on this boat in particular. So that's why you have to all come to my cabin tonight and tell me your stories. Uh, <laughs> no, I do think one by one. Storytelling is, you know, one of the oldest human impulses, and it, it, I mean, it, it's, it exists in every culture, it exists in every society, telling stories, and, you know, it, it, even if there is some kind of apocalyptic future, you know, at the end of the day, as long as we can communicate in one way or another, we're going to be able to tell stories. Yeah. So that's one thing I like about it, is that it is, it is one of the oldest human impulses, and it is one of the ones that will keep going as long as we are humanoid enough to communicate with each other. And when sometimes people say, well, what do I have that's worth saying, or why should I, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's, I have that too all the time, mm -hmm. you know? But it's like, if it's just you and your journal, it doesn't matter. And the, the, the most important thing is, you do have something that's worth saying. Your experience is absolutely worth, you know, chronicling. Yeah. And it will be helpful, at the very least to you, and perhaps future civilizations. Uh, I do want to point out, though, there's a huge difference between journaling and writing a memoir. Sure. Because a memoir is, is not like, oh, here are my experiences. Like, you, it, it takes, it's, it's a lot less fun than that, because you really have to craft it. Like, there needs to be, like, a narrative, usually. Like, you know, what is this a book about? And, you know, when you're living your life day to day, you're like, what is this about? You know, it's the age-old question, you know. You don't have to know that. I don't have to know that. But if I'm writing a memoir that's going to go into people's hands, like there has to be a point, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> there, there does, and that's where I think the filtering process comes yeah. in. Yeah. And the filtering yeah. process can either be uh, workshopping with your friends, with sensitivity readers, with uh, you know your first readers, editors, and, all and, and yeah, and editors and everything. And that's where it comes in because yeah, there were definitely times that editors have said to me. Like, oh, I don't know about this one, or hmm, maybe, you know, this might be interesting to you, but I don't know if other people will quite connect to it. Absolutely. And what I always say is I don't believe in killing your darlings. I say it's more like giving your darlings a haircut. Mm -hmm. So you can see their beautiful eyes better. <laughs> and, and I think what I always end up telling myself is, well, I'll save it for a rainy day. And a lot of the times it's actually been true, where I've taken that story and told it a different time. Yeah. Editors of memoir, I feel like they should get like a psych, like an honorary psychology degree. <laughs> 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 and they're like, oh, well, what about this point? Uh, yeah. I get a lot of questions. No, so no, <laughs> right. This, this is literally what I was hoping for, that I would pop something out and then you guys would uh, just keep talking and I would just sit there and be like, Yes. Yeah, I feel you as a frequent moderator of panels. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's it's much better to have you guys go on as long as you're on topic mostly. Next yeah. question, John. Yes. <laughs> Can I actually ask a question. Yes, I mean, please do. Yeah. Because I, I like I, I only know my experience as a memoir person, um, a memoirist, as they say. Um, but I was wondering if y'all, uh, when as you were writing your memoirs, like were there things that you realized about yourself um, as like in the writing process or in the editing process, uh, speaking to like the, the, the editors as therapists, like mm -hmm. were there points where you're like, oh, that's why I did that, or that's why that happened? I mean, the short answer is yes. I'm trying to think of an example that would be interesting to hear. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember thinking as I was writing it that like, like I could have come out as queer in my first book, but I didn't quite feel ready for it. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, when I did come out, I wish I had come out a different way because it was at a time where there was a lot of loss and trauma in my life, and I was feeling compelled to say something about, you know, and I and I got a lot of backlash for it immediately. Um, and I could have come out in my book. There was a story I could have told in my book, but I remember going back and being like, no, I'm not ready to tell that story yet. Um, but I think that... Um, and then when I wrote, you know, a second, like, shorter sort of memoir, I addressed it much more in that because I was like, well, it's been, you know, five, six years since I came out. I know a lot more about myself now, and I've analyzed a lot about my own past and everything. But I do think that even writing that first draft made me face up a lot of things about myself. I also think I realized what a people pleaser I was. 
which I never expected because I always thought of people pleasers as being sort of like perpetually cheerful, you know, like, oh, I can do anything kind of people and not the like, you know, dressed all in black, like, like uh, you know, morbid people like myself. <laughs> um, but, but I think that one of the reasons that I have been so like uh, grumpy and, and confused and anxious so much of my life is probably because I've tried really hard to please and you can't please everybody and so that leads you to becoming really disappointed with yourself. So I actually wrote a little memoir called Good Girls Don't about being a people pleaser. And uh, so yeah, writing my first memoir let me realize, oh, I'm a people pleaser. And I wrote my second memoir, which is about being a people pleaser and how that led to what, uh, let's see, any children are here? Uh, what I call the bitch cycle. <laughs> Because you commit to something because that's what a good girl does, or what a good, you know, a, a good kid does, genderless. Um, although I do think Ava people sometimes can feel it, um, or feminine people can feel it pretty strongly because of the way society is. And then, uh, and then you feel really frustrated and overwhelmed because you've said yes to too much, and then uh, you lash out or you say, I can't do this, and everybody thinks, God, what a bitch. And that leads you back into trying to people please and not being a bitch and doing that. So yeah, I think in some ways writing a memoir can often lead you into writing another memoir. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I think with Vacation Land, I opened that, I think I opened it. Early on there's a story about how I had to go to this rural dump and I was terrified of the men who ran the garbage hole uh, <laughs> because we were not technically allowed to dump in that county. Um, and I was afraid that I was going to get thrown in dump jail if they ever asked. And so I had this story about how uh, I was told by my father to tell them if I were ever asked that we're staying with Jackie Brown. Uh, her resident, <laughs> no, not, not because that's an Elmore Leonard novel, right? But that is a friend of my mom's. We were visiting, well, there was a friend of my mom's who lived in the town where you were allowed to use the dump. And so for years I would practice this lie in case I was ever called out by the dumpling. And uh, like, we're staying with Jackie Brown, we're staying with Jackie Brown. And as I say in the book, like after years of this happening, something terrible happened, which was that um, Jackie Brown died. And there went my alibi, because they would probably know. And I was, now I was going in with nothing, right. no story to tell. Right. And it was, took me years to understand. They don't care. <laughs> they don't care. They're not, they don't care, they just, you, you just throw up, you just throw your garbage into the hole and go away. <laughs> and it was only, and only when sort of telling that story and writing it down, did I come to understand about myself as I'm an only child, and for years people would say, you must have hated being an only child. I'm like, I'm sorry, you were jealous of my bunk beds. <laughs> that I got to choose which one I slept in at any time. Sorry, sorry you had to share your parents' love. Like, there's nothing wrong <laughs> to me with being an only child at all. And until I realized that I had been lying to those dump men, I realized that being an only child, and, and particularly an only child who's not interested in sports, I had no ritualized conflict growing up at all. Right. And so I was mortally terrified of it. All conflict, all high energy interpersonal interaction seemed potentially fatal to me. And since I wrote that, I was able to, you know, do some work on that. And now, uh, now I throw my dump away, my, I throw my garbage away with uh, confidence. <laughs> and what about you, Mark? Um, oh, I, yeah. <laughs> um, I, uh, when, with my first book, Kiss and Tell, I, I kind of, I, I so that, that's a bunch of stories about all these people that I had crushes on, or first kisses, or, and that sort of thing from age zero to 22, and um, and and I, I I was writing them story by story, so each comic is about a different person uh, that I hooked up with or whatever. Um, and sometimes they go kind of long, but um, at one point, so when I was writing the book, uh, it took about eight years to write the book and draw it. And during the creation of it, I um, that's around when Friendster happens. I don't know if y'all. Oh know yeah. That. Um, but it was amazing because I was, I'm one of those people who look, looks back a lot, which is probably why memoir is so great for me. Yeah. Um, and I just like think about like, you know, you know where's this person now? Well, suddenly I was able to reach out to these people and find out that they were still out there. Um, and, uh, 
And so I was reaching out to everyone I could find who was going to be in the book and saying, okay, how did that really happen? Like, I was trying to jog my memory. I had my girls that I was um, referring to. And it was, uh, and, and at this point, I, it, it was kind of like all over the place. I don't think I had an editor yet. Like, I was just like, I was just in the creation of it. And it was just stories. And then I found one person, and I'm like, I remember how we started dating, but I don't remember how we stopped. I just remember it was kind of explosive. And his, his, um, response was so jarring to me and he said, oh, you were still in love with your ex. Um, and I don't remember it that way and at, this, at the time I certainly didn't think so. Um, and then but that once I realized like, oh, he was right. And then I realized the through line through the whole book. I was like, oh, that's why I did that. Oh, that's why I was so emotionally unavailable after him. Like, I'm, <laughs> But it was, it was so obvious. But then suddenly, that's what the book was about, right. which was really great. Um, but yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to ask one more question for them, and they'll go on for a while because that's what they do. Um, but no, no, no. This is this is all positive. Again, no one is here to listen to me. They're not here to listen to you. But after that, we will get to questions. We have microphones here and here. Um, and if you have mobility issues, raise your hand, and we will get a microphone out to you. Um, and remember my three rules of questions, uh, and then we'll do that, and then... I also have a rule about questions. What is your rule about No it? fucking rules. Yeah. Say whatever you want to say. Yeah. Yeah, you, you know what's going to happen now? You're going to get like six people in a row. This is more of a comment, and it's a six-part Wonderful. Comment. I'm curious what other people have to say. You know what? <laughs> Compliment us, that's cool I, too. I, that's here's, here's what I'm going to say. As moderator, listen to me, but then knock on his door at 3 a.m. with your comments. 10005, I want to hear your stories. I, I think comments are for signings. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. comments, I, comments. We'll, we'll do some comments back and forth at the signing. Yeah, after. absolutely. But I, will, but I will say that like, if you have a question that you want to ask me because you haven't seen me on the boat, and you're better like, it doesn't fit into the memoir theme, I don't care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, my last question, again, very sort of basic uh, question, which, but ultimately is, knowing what you know now, could go back and talk to the person who was starting their memoir. Um, what would you say to the earlier you? Draw better. <laughs> <laughs> Take more figure drawing classes. Like, oh, I get better. <laughs> <laughs> I do think I would probably tell myself to uh, enjoy having secrets and also um, I think that, you know, I spent a lot of time railing and against, railing against things and raging against things on social media and I think I needed to keep in mind that even though like I made some, you know, wonderful friends there, some present company included, mm -hmm. uh, that that I, I didn't need to live a public life in order to be a memoirist, you know? I didn't need to to be, you know, and that, that's a short-term thing, not a long-term thing, and to focus more on the long-term. And also, yeah, also take joy in privacy and in secrets, and, uh, and you know, think more, think, think more, a little bit more long-term about things. I think that I was so desperate also to to be an author, to write a book, to be an author, to write a book, and and uh, while I'm definitely proud of my memoir, I do think like, okay, well maybe I could have made this and you know and shared this story, or maybe rewritten this story, and, and you know thought a little bit more about this. And I mean, I'm definitely the kind of person who looks back on my life and goes, you should have done this, you should have done that, you shouldn't have done that, you shouldn't have done this. So. But yeah, I think focusing focusing on long term and also valuing my own life and my own privacy. And, and really remembering the filtering rule, remembering that it needs to be filtered, I think uh, probably would have helped me a lot. Yeah, yeah I wish I had taken that advice too. Uh, <laughs> why didn't you give it to me? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there was what, like, you know, I, I, again, the stories in these two books are stories that I felt like I had to tell. Sure, I might not have been right, but I felt that I had to tell right. them. And I stand by all, all of them, particularly because they, even when they're as self-involved as most only children are, sure. what I am, I hope, conveying is a sense of like, here's some humiliating things that happened to me and what I learned from them. Right. Um, there was one time when I broke my rule, though, and there was someone I was in, in my 
professional past that I was a little not happy with. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I didn't name the person, but I told a story that I think is true, like in, in my memory, it was true, but it did not reflect well on them. And there was a particular turn of phrase that I used that really tickled me, but was not going to mean anything to anyone else in the world except that person. Right. And I was like, well, this person will never... No, they always do. Never they always read the book. Do. Well, and this person never would have, but in my quest for uh, pathetic money, I allowed a section, this section of the book to be printed in the New York Times Magazine. And our fr my friends at the New York Times Magazine, where I'm a contributor, I, I should know and remember that uh, they have fact checkers. Yeah. And they're going to want to know who this person is. Yeah. And then run this specific sentence by them. Oh. And I, I told them that I, what I should have done was not have told the joke at all. Like, because right. I knew it was coming from a mean place, and that's not where you want to come from. But in any case, and I got an email from this person saying, hey, I thought we were on good terms, but uh, I just got a call. It's, what's coming out in this, in this uh, book of yours? And I had to reveal to them the, the joke, and they remembered it a different way, and then I had to apologize and take it out of the paperback. Not because it wasn't true. Well, it was. It did happen the way I remembered, but it was just pointlessly hurtful. Yeah. And I, and, I, and I think that it, it also happens to you. Well, I won't say anymore. That's the thing I was supposed to have learned, right? Yes. Yeah. I'll stop it. <laughs> I think, I mean, when, oh, sorry. No, no, no. Because I think no. they kind of a joke is, I mean, it's not a joke. There are a couple, but one panel in the first book that I wish I'd drawn with the bubble outside of the scene instead of inside, and I will. I was going to mention that to you. <laughs> <laughs> My books I'm pretty happy with, but like I have made some mistakes with writing memoir and publishing it in like anthologies where I've um, where I've hurt people um, and that, that I was at fault and where I've hurt people and I wasn't at fault. Like I don't think I was because people change their minds all the time about what they what they're okay with. So like you ask for consent, like later on, like ten years down the line, they could be like, you know, I'm actually not happy that you published that even with my consent. See, I mean, I have nothing. I can't do anything about that. But along the line, I've started creating my, I've created my golden rule, which I generally follow, follow, which is tell my own secrets and not other people's secrets. And if you, if other people are involved, like just disguise them so much. Um, I mean, people will still recognize themselves, um, even if that's not even them, <laughs> uh, which happens a lot. They're like, oh, you wrote about me, and I thought it was not about you, dude. <laughs> I would like to congratulate my three panelists because literally just by talking, they covered every single question that I would have asked them. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and and, and I, I've been a little snipey at you, this panel, John, but I want you and everyone to know that I love you and I'm just oh, making fun in a friendly way. I, I love, love you too, John. Yeah. yeah. It makes me feel good. So we have, <laughs> we have six minutes for questions. So if you have questions, come down uh, now and ask them. Banana. Banana person is striding confidently to the microphone. All right. Well, what's your name? My name is William. Hi, William. How are you? Our one is my one more question. How do you balance the demands of a good story with the actual literal truth of what happened? Hmm. <laughs> I, I tell the truth to the best of my recollection. I never conflate. I never change details unless I'm protecting the person, another person, like their, their privacy. Even then, I'm not sure that I, I would, I would, even then I'm not sure I wouldn't prefer simply to not tell the story than tell a story that had been juiced, which seems very strange given that my other job had been making up fake facts and lying like, but perhaps because of that line, you know, like bananas, you know what I mean? Banana style line. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and I, um, I will, like, go hyperbolic at times for a joke, but only when I have tagged in the prose that this is not what happened. Yeah. Like, I might say, you know, like, X, Y, Z happened and then Something bananas happen, yeah. and then I would say, of course, that's not actually what happened, and, you know, so on. But I, I kind of take it seriously, 
And, um, and I think that uh, it's obviously part of the conversation, particularly in the world of comedy. And um, that's all I'm going to say about it. Tomorrow. I think that hyperbole can be, I, I think hyperbole is safe when it's something that just involves you, perhaps. I, I think that when it involves other people, you really do want to you know, give it to the best of your recollection. And I've had people tell me later, like, that's not how I remember it. And I've been like, oh, yeah. well, I'm sorry, this is how I remember it, and this is what I remember happening. And, you know, and they're like, okay, well, well, I understand that some people are more understanding about others, but because of that, I try to keep it to, you know, like, maybe I say something happens the next day and it actually happens the next week. I've done that, but I try to be very careful as well. I tell my students that there's a difference between uh, autobiography and memoir. It's like memoir is not factual, um, and that isn't that, that you can make up shit. It's just like this is your memory, whether or not that's correct. This is your memory, and if you know that it's not correct, maybe like a little footnote or saying that this isn't correct. I mean, for comic's sake, like I'll have my cat, like sometimes respond in English, but that's not actually how it happened. And I assume that my readers understand this. <laughs> I, mean, I would say you would be surprised. Hi, cat speaks me all the time. Question here. Okay, so I have um, an ace child and a child that's in the middle of transitioning, and genderqueer became a very big book to talk Ooh. about those things. Yes. My student wrote uh, that. Yeah, and it's a beautiful book and has been canceled out the wazoo across the country. You have experienced being canceled in book banning, and that's a level of bravery that I cannot imagine. How has that affected you as a memoirist and having to then not only expose yourself that way, but defend yourself? I mean, it sucks. Um, it's not bravery because I had no consent in that. <laughs> like, I had no choice about that. Um, it, yeah, I, was, I always joked that I wanted to be banned because that would give me some kind of cred, but um, honestly, it just sucks. Um, but me and Maya have done a bunch of panels together. They were my student, um, and, I, and I'm just, I'm so proud of them for how how much they've had to go through and have just stuck up for other um, more marginalized authors. Uh, as they as um, like to say that they're white um, and fairly privileged, so they are able to. They're glad that they are the leader of this or the scapegoat right now because they can handle it. Whereas there's a lot of like you know people who aren't as privileged uh, out there. Um, so that's true bravery, is being like, okay, well, I'm cool with being the scapegoat, and I'm going to take this on for everyone. Uh, me, I'm just, like, one person. <laughs> Question over here. You also have, um, thanks for sale up in the Leo deck, and I do recommend everyone, you know, pick it up. But I was wondering, if you were to recommend something that was not your own, just a memoir that you genuinely love, what would be your generic recommendation that's not, like, targeted to one person, but just, hey, I just think everybody might like this. Ooh. Palestine by Joe Sacco, yes. or any work by Joe Sacco. Um, I have a couple. Persepolis is one of my favorite ones. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. yeah. Um, also, um, I think this got some more between the world and me. Um, and let's see, and the boys of my youth by John. Oh, yeah, that's such a good one. Such a good book. Yeah, yeah the boys of my youth. Love that book. Tiny Beautiful Things by Cheryl Strait. That um, that pushed me to be a better memoirist. Question here. Um, um, John, in, in passing in your book, you mentioned uh, your son listened to Mark Lucy. I don't know if you remember that, but it was just in passing. Um, but uh, he's my best friend, and he wanted to say that he was grateful to you mentioning it and your son for listening to him, that he was very uh, thankful for that. So you're making a reference. You're making a reference to some of the bands that my son listened to, and I talked about yes. all these names of these bands that I've never heard before. And um, <laughs> one of the bands is Mark from the Sea, Mark of the Sea. And uh, then I got some feedback, which is that's a that's a band, you know. It's like, oh, I thought I made it up. So oh, no, it's just him. I I I love him now. <laughs> I've listened. <laughs> But that was a wonderful way to come to his music, because I didn't know. I just thought that was a cool name for him. Yeah, a band. He, he, he will never come on the cruise, but he wanted to say oh. his thing. Oh, that's great. Thank um, you. But uh, my question, I have an actual question. 
<laughs> yeah, spouse, do you want to punish this person? Because, uh, I, I will allow it under the Hodgman rule. But, 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 but um, uh, I wanted to, I'm not sure if any of you have come across this, but if you ever in your book had mentioned someone who had previously passed on, if legally speaking, if there was someone you had to speak to in order to name that person by name, or if you're, mm. if it's all good to, to name them. Legally, you cannot libel or slander the dead. Well, um, not slander, I just mean no, no, but I mean that in the larger sense that from a legal point of view, there's no recourse once someone's passed on. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we are unfortunately at this moment out of time. There will be another panel here in uh, just about 10 minutes about science fiction and in the future. But in the meantime, John Hodgman, Mara Wilson, Mari Naomi, thank you so much for being part of this. And thank you all. John William Banana, everyone. And all the cosplayers and non-cosplayers at sea. <laughs>